just just uh, like I think it was a one forty point four or so one forty point five in qualifying was uh, uh, was was a seven hundred and something horsepower uh, car. Uh, that that was that was pretty special, uh, and and probably to this day remains one of my best laps and one of my best feel memory kind of thing. I'm thinking we need and not and b- before you retire, we need to have some sort of Seb's day at a track of your choice where we, you know, hopefully the owners of these things can wheel out the 908s and the you name it, all the things that you love driving cuz uh you know, while I enjoy seeing some of the legends from the past climb in at 70 years old to dawdle around, at least you get to see him going around a track at a vintage event, you know. I like the idea of someone who uh, you know hasn't hung up their helmet yet, saying, "You know, I do have an inventory of some pretty amazing cars I've driven. Let's go enjoy them before uh, you know." Uh, I truly just want to get fat like uh, good old hamburger here and uh, kick my feet up and uh, enjoy retirement. Amen to that. All right, let's see. Here's a question. I think you asked this last week, Chad, and we didn't get to it. Chad Pritchard asks, "Will IndyCar ever?" start using onboard starters on their cars since it's really annoying to go full course yellow because the car stalled after a spin what is the primary reason for not having starters well uh, i'd say tradition uh, as i hear the um, folks outside with lawnmowers going nuts so apologize for that but chad i'd say tradition is uh, a big part of it i mean there are actual reasons such as reducing weight uh, and not just the how's this weight and packaging certainly a concern uh, the packaging itself I would say is probably the the bigger reason why we do not have them because there isn't a lot of free space uh, in an in IndyCar but it's been this way for decades upon decades well, the, we tried and failed in the champ cars. I mean, if you remember when yep. the panels came out, we had, you know, we, we had to up on the cables, and the car would actually start when it was cold, and uh, and when it got hot, and everything was hot, and the starter was hot, and drew even more power, and you couldn't put enough of a you know big battery to 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 be able to to make it survive those environments, and so it's a uh, it's. You know, with, with the packaging that we have and the weight restrictions that we kind of put upon ourselves and, and everything, it, it just gets pretty difficult to, to do that. On top of the fact that I think the compression levels in these engines these days are uh, you know, quite high. And oh, yeah. you, you see some really, really big starters starting those things with big batteries. And uh, and so it would take a, you know, it would take a pretty significant um, um, yeah, it would take a pretty significant source of power to, to get it done. And, and like you said, fitting it and installation is a, is a whole different level. And depending on your view of racing, uh, it's fairly rare where if we have a 100-lap race wherever, that all 100 laps uh, are run without interruption. Uh, you know, the, the spin and whether it's needing to retrieve a car that's stalled or someone nosed into the tires... I I don't know if I really separate these things into different areas. If a circumstance has happened where a car needs to be retrieved, whether it's a spin install or a slight off, whatever, an intervention is required. Um, and sometimes breaking up the race a little bit, whether it's altering strategy. I mean, nonlinear racing t- can be the stuff that is most enjoyable because the unpredictability of what happens and the timing of when certain things happen um you know there are times where we're all grown like oh not now and then there are other times you're like yeah all right this actually works and uh it fits so i i hear you chad i'm not not dismissing your question or the thought process behind it but uh there are practical reasons why these cars don't have them seb mentioned you know one that is very key uh it is far hotter uh in the engine bay of an indy car than any road or street car and the sheer size of what would be needed to do this with an onboard starter is also unreasonable considering the uh the rather small uh, waste and whatnot, the back of the car. So, uh, and then there was also Greg Liversedge mentions that there was the attempt to use anti-stall uh, with the new DW12 package, and it kind of worked a little bit for a little while, but not really. And then I think both Chevy and Honda said, "All right, we're we're, we're not going to invest a whole lot more time into this because it's not really going 
anywhere. And uh, Greg Seb asks a question, uh, a separate question. He says, after your wreck at Indy and the recovery process started, he said, what was the conversation like with your wife? He's, he's curious, you know, was there a conversation or debate about the future as, you know, whether you would continue or was it as simple as how quick can I get behind the wheel of a car? No, we, we definitely talked about it, but uh, yeah, Claire never really felt comfortable, you know, telling me what to do with my career. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, yeah, yeah, obviously, uh, love her for that as well. Uh, I think uh, she knows how big a part of my life this is and, and how important it is to me. And um, you know, we, we both know, unfortunately, too well the risks of, of uh, that profession, but um, yeah, I think. Uh, it is, a, it is a choice you make, and um, and you kind of stick to it. He also asks, are you tired of being asked so many questions pertaining to your crash? Uh, and he said, he, you know, is there any fear that the incident will be part of your legacy that's, you know, shown every year in the intro for the Indy 500 and so on? You know, I guess the, the heart of the question is, do you want to be 70 years old, um, you know, turning on the TV or whatever it is to watch the Indy 500? Like, oh, Jesus, here we go again. Turn to there. Yep, that's Grandpa on fire. Um, are there any concerns about that or... Uh, do you just accept that, hey, just like the winds, that's also part of my history? Well, I wish I'd be more famous for what I've done good than for a wreck, but unfortunately, Google says otherwise. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just the way it is. Unfortunately, uh, you know, you type my name these days on on there, and the first thing that comes up is, uh, is a ball of fire upside down uh, going still 200 miles an hour. So, uh it is it is what it is man you can't control that and um yeah i mean it's not not necessarily something i want to be talking about over and over again but uh yeah nothing i can really do about it so just uh just go with the flow so when you're in turn two and the back of the car is starting to slide all right um let's move on to a question here from adam klinger who says seal master seb congrats on the win can I tell you how much I love the fact that I've kind of given you a strange nickname and it's it's actually living on a little bit? Um, he says, what is it about your relationship with Craig Hampson that makes the two of you such a successful duo? It's a great question, Adam. I don't know. It must be the fact that we get pissed at each other all the time. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it isn't It is always the lovey-dovey thing, but you guys seem to have the ability to push uh, but come back to a, a positive place. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, he understands me better than most. I think I'm, I'm very lucky to have both engineers that have probably understood me the most uh, uh, in my career right now with Olivier and, and Craig. And they're, you know, both extremely um, passionate and, and very professional and super uh, um, committed to this and, and extremely good at it. And uh and they're both friends, and uh, and we, you know, yeah, we, I, I really didn't want to do it any any other way. Um, so it's it's tough to explain why things are the way they are. But um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you know, I say a couple of words, and and he looks at me, and and he kind of knows what's going on and what we need to do, and that's that's invaluable in racing. For, for a driver so you know and, and you know I've got to give it to Craig it's, he hasn't been uh, um, you know Sebastian Bordet's favorite uh, I think uh, if you ask James Hinchcliffe or a couple of other guys Oriole or you know the, who've worked with him they, they, they would tell you the same thing so alright Seb let's wrap up here with a couple of questions before you have to head back to normal life uh, let's see, let's see, where shall we go? Well, this is a good one from Simon Spiker. I don't know if it's so much of a question, but more of a, a statement. Is Vassar still partying after that win? Um, <laughs> <laughs> has he sobered up yet? Maybe that's the real question. Uh, man, it was, it was just cool, you know. It, was, uh, it, it threw me back to uh, that win at, uh, at, uh, at the mile that we had uh, in, uh, in 15 and just... Uh, just great to have those guys around you know it's uh, such a such a character uh, such characters between Sully and, and Jimmy and uh, you know just uh, just really good friends so uh, 
yeah, it's a, it's an interesting pair, and uh, with with Dale, you know, it's just, uh, you couldn't get three uh, more diverse personalities. But uh, you know, I think uh, I can only hope that it's the beginning of uh, a great thing. And uh, yeah, I think everybody was pretty happy. But uh, no, no, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy was fine. I've known Vassar for I think twenty nine years now, almost thirty, and. Uh always a source for fun we can say that for sure of uh, james axel vassar patrick mctee says fun question for seb if you could choose any car from any era any track etc what would you choose so uh when you get to play fantasy when you're sitting around thinking about all the cool amazing cars you've read about maybe seen in a museum i don't know uh, are there anywhere you're like man if i could have that thing at uh whatever track that would be my my personal fantasy day. Hmm. I don't know. That's that's an interesting one, man. I uh, yeah, I, I'm, I consider myself very lucky uh, that I, I got to drive all the cars that I've driven, uh, and I you know it's. Uh, I think if uh, if there was maybe one thing I'd kind of be very curious about might might be the GTP cars. You know, back uh, back when they had just incredible horsepower just just to kind of feel it out and also like you know they started to have significant and serious amount of downforce um so yeah i, I think i'd be pretty curious to throw on a, one of those out at like broad america or a place like that you know, <laughs> yeah I'd be, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, be talking you're pulling on my heartstrings here uh let's see a couple more here uh i'm trying to look at some who've uh all right, Alan Bandy is a good one, and I know the answer, some of the answers to this, but not all. Seb, who were some of your racing idols growing up? And maybe uh, I'll throw in, how much was uh, the person you called Dad an idol if we're thinking about racing? Uh, yeah, well, um, I had one idol was Ayrton. Uh, obviously, that, that, you know, I think it just comes at that time in your life where you're in in that phase where you can dream and project and and really be inspired by someone uh and then yeah you know obviously my dad was just uh you know i owe him everything as far as the, the my racing career i uh, grew up on the racetrack got a motorcycle i was three um uh, you know he kind of paved the road for me to just you know do what i what i love doing and uh, and to give me all the tools to to do it and uh grow up in that that environment and and very much enjoy it every every, every little bit every step of the way so uh, it's uh it's it's probably a little bit more complex than that but uh, the short version of it is that i think one of the reasons you and i connected seb is or at least from my perspective you are despite your talents as a race car driver and all the things you've you've achieved in sport you're one of the most normal people I've come to know. And I don't mean lacking interesting elements and whatnot. I just mean there are no errors. You're just, you know, you're a normal person who has, you know, some amazing abilities in an area that happens to be very entertaining as well. But I know you think of yourself as just a normal guy. Do you, knowing that you have heroes, right, the Senas and, and, and whatnot, is it odd at all for you to think that although you consider yourself a normal guy, you know, husband, father, etc., uh, there are some people in the world who look to you as their hero? I mean, uh, I'm guessing that might be a strange thing to process, knowing that you aren't walking around going, aha, I am a star and you should admire me. Uh, well, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that is tough to process because it's it's factual I and mean, it just it's it's weird because yeah like you said you know for me i'm, I'm just a, a normal guy who gets to do something pretty abnormal and and who considers himself very lucky to you know to do the job and he's doing and, and to get paid for it um but uh yeah i i yeah i, I never quite know how to interact with the people who idolize you because it's it's hard for the most part you know the 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 response you get from from your your biggest fans like that they just for you it's not in line with the way you see yourself it's 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 kind of awkward for me um but i i try to give back as much as i can it's just uh yeah it's sometimes it, it just kind of 
takes you by surprise and, and you don't really know what to say or what to do. But, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I think, uh,